Greetings and welcome to room 303 in Junior English. We are in your hymnals in 1408-1409 and we will be talking now with Amy Tan uh, and uh, the text Mother Tongue. Let's do a little bit of background information and biography on 1409 quickly. Notice that Tan is born in 1952. Uh, let's read, as a child, Amy Tan, the daughter of Chinese immigrants, answered her mother's <laughs> Chinese questions in English. Growing up in Oakland, California, Tan continued to embrace typical American values which she assumed defined her identity. First heading, early years. Tan's parents both came to America in search of a more peaceful life. Her father left his home to avoid the Chinese Civil War while her, while her mother found passage to America on the last boat to leave Shanghai before the communist takeover of 1949. Her parents married and settled in Northern California where they raised Amy and her two brothers. Next heading, moving abroad. While still in her teens, tragedy struck Tan's family. Within a year, Amy's father and oldest brother both died of brain tumors. Mrs. Tan moved her surviving children to Switzerland, where Amy finished high school. The next heading, changing careers. After graduating from college in America, Tan began a successful business writing career. Though she prospered financially, Tan found her work unfulfilling and sought relief by playing piano and writing fiction. After publishing several short stories, Tan found an agent who encouraged her to write full time. The last heading, a rich background. A trip to China with her mother kindled in Tan an appreciation of her Chinese roots. At the time, she was leaving a successful career as a business writer to become a fiction writer. When she returned to the United States, she began the Joy Luck Club in 1989, a novel about four Chinese-American women and their mothers, very, very influential novel. The book made Tan a celebrity and was followed by more novels, including The Kitchen God's Wife in 91, The Hundred Secret Senses in 95, and The Bone Setter's Daughter in 2001. Before we work with Mother Tongue, let's jump over to page 1408 and do a little bit of work at 2B, the, refle uh, the uh, rhetoric level. Uh, literary analysis. An essay is a short piece of nonfiction in which a writer explores his or her view of a topic. In a, let's write it down, reflective essay. So write that down because that's what this is. The writer describes a personal experience, condition, or even event and reflects on its larger meanings. For example, Rita Dove, we'll be looking with uh, both Amy Tan and Rita Dove here in a moment. Rita Dove's for the love of books. Rita Dove focuses on the love of reading she had since she was a child. Quote, always I have been passionate about books. I love to feel their heft in my hand. In most reflective essays, the writer makes connections between personal experience and a larger or more universal idea about life. So write it, write it down right away at level one. In this essay, we will be working with reflections back on earlier life and earlier childhood times. These two writers, both Amy Tan and Rita Dove, address the same central idea or theme, the struggle to create a sense of identity. So write that down. In, in, this, in this essay and the one to follow, we will be, we'll be commenting on the struggle to define who am I, who, what's my identity, by some kind of an experience that maybe one goes through. Okay. As you read, examine how each writer describes the role played by other people in her creation of a <coughs> genuine sense of self. Determine if a true sense of identity is to be discovered among our companions in the recesses of our own privacy or in some combination of the two. The reading strategy here um, is suggested regardless of its specific organizational structure, an effective essay presents ideas in a logical order. To better appreciate this logic, to clarify the meaning of an essay, outline the text as you read. Obviously, this is what we do at level one, but you can use the um, graph there on the side. Also, please do note that you got some vocabulary words at the bottom of 14.8 that you want to pay attention to. All right, we're going to turn now to mother tongue. Let's just uh, take down a few notes really quickly at level one. This essay demonstrates how much people miss when they make snap judgments or apply stereotypes. Amy Tan paints a portrait of her mother as an intelligent and perceptive woman who encounters difficulties because of her non-standard English. Tan contrasts the valuable lessons she's learned from her mother with the English-speaking English world's view of her mother. This essay celebrates the many ways people can communicate and identifies Tan's central goal as a writer, to be readable. Let's go ahead now and just follow along. And again, we're really concentrating on what is the event out of her life that 
uh, teaches or something, this reflective essay. Let's follow along now. Pay close attention. Mother Tongue by Amy Tan. I am not a scholar of English or literature. I cannot give you much more than personal opinions on the English language and its variations in this country or others. I am a writer, and by that definition, I am someone who has always loved language. I am fascinated by language in daily life. I spend a great deal of my time thinking about the power of language, the way it can evoke an emotion, a visual image, a complex idea, or a simple truth. Language is the tool of my trade, and I use them all, all the Englishes I grew up with. Recently, I was made keenly aware of the different Englishes I do use. I was giving a talk to a large group of people, the same talk I had already given to half a dozen other groups. The nature of the talk was about my writing, my life, and my book, The Joy Luck Club. The talk was going along well enough until I remembered one major difference that made the whole talk sound wrong. My mother was in the room, and it was perhaps the first time she had heard me give a lengthy speech, using the kind of English I have never used with her. I was saying things like, the intersection of memory upon imagination, and there is an aspect of my fiction that relates to thus and thus, a speech filled with carefully wrought grammatical phrases, burdened, it suddenly seemed to me, with nominalized forms, past perfect tenses, conditional phrases, all the forms of standard English that I had learned in school and through books, the forms of English I did not use at home with my mother. Just last week, I was walking down the street with my mother, and again, I found myself conscious of the English I was using, the English I do use with her. We were talking about the price of new and used furniture, and I heard myself saying this, not waste money that way. My husband was with us as well, and he didn't notice any switch in my English. And then I realized why. It's because over the 20 years we've been together, I've often used that same kind of English with him, and sometimes he even uses it with me. It has become our language of intimacy, a different sort of English that relates to family talk, the language I grew up with. So you'll have some idea of what this family talk I heard sounds like. I'll quote what my mother said during a recent conversation, which I videotaped and then transcribed. During this conversation, my mother was talking about a political gangster in Shanghai who had the same last name as her family's, Du and how the gangster, in his early years, wanted to be adopted by her family, which was rich by comparison. Later, the gangster became more powerful, far richer than my mother's family, and one day showed up at my mother's wedding to pay his respects. Here's what she said in part. Du Yu Song having business like fruit stand, like off the street kind, he is Du like Du Song, but not so Ming Island people. The local people call Putong, the river east side, he belonged to that side, local people. That man wanted to ask Dusong's father to take him in like become own family. Dusong's father wasn't looked down on him, but didn't take seriously until that man big like become a mafia. Now important person, very hard to inviting him. Chinese way, came only to show respect, don't stay for dinner. Respect for making big celebration, he shows up, I mean gives lots of respect. Chinese custom. Chinese social life that way. If too important, won't have to stay too long. He come to my wedding. I didn't see, I heard it. I gone to boy's side. They have YMCA dinner. Chinese age, I was 19. You should know that my mother's expressive command of English belies how much she actually understands. She reads the Forbes report, listens to Wall Street Week, converses daily with her stockbroker, reads all of Shirley MacLaine's books with ease, all kinds of things I can't begin to understand. Yet some of my friends tell me they understand 50% of what my mother says. Some say they understand 80 to 90%. Some say they understand none of it, as if she were speaking pure Chinese. But to me, my mother's English is perfectly clear, perfectly natural. It's my mother tongue. Her language, as I hear it, is vivid, direct, full of observation and imagery. That was the language that helped shape the way I saw things, expressed things, made sense of the world. Lately, I've been giving more thought to the kind of English my mother speaks. Like others, I have described it to people as 
broken or fractured English. But I wince when I say that. It has always bothered me that I can think of no way to describe it other than broken, as if it were damaged and needed to be fixed, as if it lacked a certain wholeness and soundness. I've heard other terms used, limited English, for example, but they seem just as bad, as if everything is limited, including people's perceptions of the limited English speaker. I know this for a fact, because when I was growing up, my mother's limited English limited my perception of her. I was ashamed of her English. I believed that her English reflected the quality of what she had to say. That is, because she expressed them imperfectly, her thoughts were imperfect. And I had plenty of empirical evidence to support me. The fact that people in department stores, at banks, and at restaurants did not take her seriously, did not give her good service, pretended not to understand her, or even acted as if they did not hear her. My mother has long realized the limitations of her English as well. When I was 15, she used to have me call people on the phone to pretend I was she. In this guise, I was forced to ask for information or even to complain and yell at people who had been rude to her. One time, it was a call to her stockbroker in New York. She had cashed out her small portfolio, and it just so happened we were going to go to New York the next week, our very first trip outside California. I had to get on the phone and say in an adolescent voice that was not very convincing, this is Mrs. Tan. And my mother was standing in the back whispering loudly, why he don't send me check already two weeks late, so mad he lied to me losing me money. And then I said in perfect English, yes, I'm getting rather concerned. You had agreed to send the check two weeks ago, but it hasn't arrived. Then she began to talk more loudly, what he want? I come to New York, tell in front of his boss, you're cheating me. And I was trying to calm her down, make her be quiet, while telling the stockbroker, I can't tolerate any more excuses. If I don't receive the check immediately, I'm going to have to speak to your manager when I'm in New York next week. And sure enough, the following week, there we were in front of this astonished stockbroker, and I was sitting there red-faced and quiet, and my mother, the real Mrs. Tan, was shouting at his boss in her impeccable broken English. We used a similar routine just five days ago for a situation that was far less humorous. My mother had gone to the hospital for an appointment to find out about a benign brain tumor a CAT scan had revealed a month ago. She said she had spoken very good English, her best English, no mistakes. Still, she said, the hospital did not apologize when they said they had lost the CAT scan and she had come for nothing. She said they did not seem to have any sympathy when she told them she was anxious to know the exact diagnosis since her husband and son had both died of brain tumors. She said they would not give her any more information until the next time and she would have to make another appointment for that. So she said she would not leave until the doctor called her daughter. She wouldn't budge. And when the doctor finally called her daughter, me, who spoke in perfect English, lo and behold, we had assurances the CAT scan would be found, promises that a conference call on Monday would be held, and apologies for any suffering my mother had gone through for a most to regrettable mistake. I think my mother's English almost had an effect on limiting my possibilities in life as well. Sociologists and linguists probably will tell you that a person's developing language skills are more influenced by peers. But I do think that the language spoken in the family, especially in immigrant families, which are more insular, plays a large role in shaping the language of the child. And I believe that it affected my results on achievement tests, IQ tests, and the SAT. While my English skills were never judged as poor, compared to math, English could not be considered my strong suit. In grade school, I did moderately well, getting perhaps Bs, sometimes B pluses in English, and scoring perhaps in the 60th or 70th percentile on achievement tests. But those scores were not good enough to override the opinion that my true abilities lay in math and science, because in those areas, I achieved A's and scored in the 90th percentile or higher. This was understandable. Math is precise. There is only one correct answer. Whereas, for me at least, the answers on English tests were always a judgment call, a matter of opinion and personal experience. Those tests were constructed around items like 
fill in the blank sentence completion, such as, even though Tom was blank, Mary thought he was blank. And the correct answer always seemed to be the most bland combinations of thoughts. For example, even though Tom was shy, Mary thought he was charming. With the grammatical structure, even though, limiting the correct answer to some sort of semantic opposites. So you wouldn't get answers like, even though Tom was foolish, Mary thought he was ridiculous. Well, according to my mother, there were very few limitations as to what Tom could have been and what Mary might have thought of him. So I never do well on tests like that. The same was true with word analogies. Pairs of words in which you were supposed to find some sort of logical, semantic relationship. For example, sunset is to nightfall as blank is to blank. And here you would be presented with a list of four possible pairs, one of which showed the same kind of relationship. Red is to stoplight, bus is to arrival, chills is to fever, yawn is to boring. Well, I could never think that way. I knew what the tests were asking, but I could not block out of my mind the images already created by the first pair. Sunset is to nightfall, and I would see a burst of colors against a darkening sky, the moon rising, the lowering of a curtain of stars, and all the other pairs of words, red, bus, stoplight, boring, just threw up a mass of confusing images, making it impossible for me to sort out something as logical as saying, a sunset precedes nightfall is the same as a chill precedes a fever. The only way I would have gotten that answer right would have been to imagine an associative situation. For example, my being disobedient and staying out past sunset, catching a chill at night, which turns into feverish pneumonia as punishment, which indeed did happen to me. I've been thinking about all this lately, about my mother's English, about achievement tests, because lately I've been asked, as a writer, why there are not more Asian Americans represented in American literature? Why are there so few Asian Americans enrolled in creative writing programs? Why do so many Chinese students go into engineering? Well, these are broad sociological questions I can't begin to answer, but I have noticed in surveys, in fact, just last week, that Asian students as a whole always do significantly better on math achievement tests than in English. And this makes me think that there are other Asian American students whose English spoken in the home might also be described as broken or limited. And perhaps they also have teachers who are steering them away from writing and into math and science, which is what happened to me. Fortunately, I happen to be rebellious in nature and enjoy the challenge of disproving assumptions made about me. I became an English major my first year in college after being enrolled as pre-med. I started writing nonfiction as a freelancer the week after I was told by my former boss that writing was my worst skill and I should hone my talents toward account management. But it wasn't until 1985 that I finally began to write fiction. And at first, I wrote using what I thought to be wittily crafted sentences, sentences that would finally prove I had mastery over the English language. Here's an example from the first draft of a story that later made its way into the Joy Luck Club, but without this line. That was my mental quandary in its nascent state, a terrible line which I can barely pronounce. Fortunately, for reasons I won't get into today, I later decided I should envision a reader for the stories I would write, and the reader I decided upon was my mother, because these were stories about mothers. So with this reader in mind, and in fact, she did read my early drafts. I began to write stories using all the Englishes I grew up with, the English I spoke to my mother, which, for lack of a better term, might be described as simple. The English she used with me, which, for lack of a better term, might be described as broken. My translation of her Chinese, which could certainly be described as watered down, and what I imagined to be her translation of her Chinese if she could speak in perfect English, her internal language, and for that I sought to preserve the essence, but neither an English nor a Chinese structure. I wanted to capture what language ability tests can never reveal, her intent, her passion, her imagery, the rhythms of her speech, and the nature of her thoughts. Apart from what any critic had to say about my writing, 
I knew I had succeeded where it counted when my mother finished reading my book and gave me her verdict. So easy to read. All right, let's turn now to this reflective essay. Again, let's jump to 2B for just a moment and remind ourselves. A reflective essay will reflect or look back on an experience in the writer's life, usually because the experience that's being spoken of is significant. You learn something from that experience. So jot down at level one really quickly. What is the reflection here? I mean, I, I realize this is a very simple question, but we'll ask it nonetheless. What is the simple reflection, experience, event in her life here that she is writing about? For example, is it a single specific moment that she's writing about? Or is she rather writing about something kind of general in nature, more particularly the way her mother talked? The way her mother, who was Chinese, and English was a second language for her, the way she learned how to use the language, as almost we would say survival English, right? That English earlier in the text called broken or limited or simple. Anybody that's ever learned a foreign language, though, understands what I mean when I say survivor language, right? In other words, you don't know the language well enough to be able to speak fluently or read fluently in it, but you do know the language well enough to be able to make observations to people that can get you from point A to point B. You can survive, if you will. Let's go ahead and point out then what at level one is the fundamental kind of uh, flow of this of this text. Notice that Amy Tan begins by making some observations about having her mother in the audience while she is talking about her new book, The Joy Luck Club. Then it leads her to kind of muse and reflect back on the experience of what it was like growing up as a young Chinese.